the, the context of your presentation, you mainly focused on the, the reform of the Security Council. So tell us a bit what is at stake. I mean, first of all, where do we stand today in uh, late May 2011 uh, when it comes to this issue of the reform of the Security Council? Well, it's a fascinating issue. Um, the current phase of the negotiations in the General Assembly open-ended working group on the subject, and now the intergovernmental negotiations, has been going on for 17 years. 17 years. So the open-ended working group has been nicknamed the never-ending working group. Mm -hmm. um, but the last three years, we've had what were being termed as intergovernmental negotiations under the very able chairmanship of Ambassador Tannin of Af Afghanistan. And we're beginning to see signs of compromise between the main groups that may suggest that Security Council reform is uh, maybe not immediately around the corner, but may, may be coming maybe. sometime soon. Okay, so what has been the, the main focus of this never-ending working group since it has been in place for 17 years? Uh, what was the initial mandate or purpose of this uh, working group, and why is it that it has been so difficult in terms of achieving results? Or Perhaps we have been achieving results. But tell us what is the mandate of the group and why is it so difficult after 17 years? Well, the mandate of the group is in the title. I think it has the longest title of any UN um, uh, body And ever. they tend to be long. They do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the United Nations General Assembly open-ended working group on the question of equitable representation on an increase in the membership of the Security Council, comma, and other related matters. Okay. So that gives you a sort of sense that the title is very important because every aspect of Security Council reform is very controversial. Every aspect matters a lot to member states because you've got 15 members on the Council, 192 member states. All those 192 member states would like to be on the Council one way or another. Um, and the, 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 the idea that there'll be new permanent members appeals very much to those countries that might be those new permanent members and it uh, appeals very little to those other countries that um, uh, feel that they almost meet that category but not quite. Mm -hmm. So over it... So the, the working group is very much about the, the, the composition of the, of, of the council. That's how mm -hmm. the issue of reform is being tackled, widening membership. It covers a, n a number of different aspects, and it has to because reform is seen in different ways by different member states. So it looks at composition, it looks at the working methods of the Security Council, it looks at its voting procedures, it looks at the issues of uh, regional representation, um, it looks at the relationship between the General Assembly and the Security Council. Um, so there's different what are called clusters of issues. So let's begin, uh, let's take uh, these issues one by one. First of all, composition. Well, what is at stake here? And a lot is at stake. Um, uh, composition has got uh, really sort of two, two, two elements because it relates also to categories of membership. Um, you've both got the origins of where countries sit on the Security Council and what category they're in. In 1945, the winners of World War II, the five permanent members, the US, USSR, UK, France, China, um, established a framework, the UN Charter, where they had a special position, permanent seats on the Security Council and a veto. Uh, this was really an advance on the League of Nations Council that preceded the, the, the United Nations, because there, effectively, uh, e everybody had a veto. So at the time, it was seen as actually a progressive development to only give the veto to five, um, five members. The, uh, in 1945, there were six non-permanent members, in the 1960s, this was expanded to 10. So a majority of the members of the council are elected for a two-year period, then they have to go off for at least a year, and then they can be re-elected. And they are elected by the entire membership, according to a formula. So, for example, of the 10 non-permanent seats, three are for Africa, two are for Latin America, two are for Europe and, and, and other states, two are for Asia, and one is for Eastern Europe. So, so the, 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 the bulk of the reform debates taking place today have, have, to do, have much to do with who is likely to be on the council in the context of this uh, widened uh, uh, membership, right? Exactly, and there are two pressures. There's the pressure from individual member states who believe that they are now more influential, more powerful um, than the situation in 1945, and that therefore they should join the permanent members as uh, uh, permanent members themselves. So countries like Japan, Germany, 
Brazil, uh, India, South Africa, Nigeria, um, uh, all have a strong criteria case for why they should be a permanent but, but member. But based on, I mean, we had this conversation this afternoon in the context of this uh, event, uh, the, the, the criteria have much to do with uh, size and power. It's based on geopolitics. It is, and uh, it, it's, it's one of the is interesting... Are, are these good criteria? Well, they're, they're not necessarily the criteria that will lead to a more effective or legitimate council. The, the contest for reform of the Security Council really has centered around the quest for status and power or the quest to stop other people getting yes. greater status and, and power. Uh, people very rarely talk about the purpose of the council, which under the Charter is the maintenance of international peace and security. It's almost as if that's a byproduct. So there isn't, you could say, a functionalist approach where how do we ensure that the Council retains its ability to maintain peace and security. Instead, the debate is all about um, who rather than what. Yeah. And do you think that it is a problem? Do you think that the fact that the, the debate uh, of the reform of the Council is framed in these terms, who rather than what, uh, has an impact on uh, uh, the ability of the Council, or what could be the ability of the Council down the road to be more effective than it is uh, today? I think so. If we were focusing on, on if the, the debate was not on who, on who, but on what, what would be the nature of the debate? Well, one aspect of the debate might be the, the simple question, what are the responsibilities that come with permanent membership, mm. both for the existing permanent members and any new countries that want to become permanent members? That's a debate that we're not having, and that's and a debate that would be valuable to have. And what's the cost of not having this debate? the cost of not having this debate, um, it may be entirely, there may be no cost because I expansion doesn't, doesn't, doesn't happen. And uh, in realistic terms, um, uh, we are not going to expand the council based on uh, criteria of contribution or criteria of mm -hmm. effectiveness. The reality is, I think, that the, that the council is a very political organ. The General Assembly, which will pass a resolution, um, expanding the council is a very political organ. Um, the bar to reform in the UN Charter is very high, and all those factors mean that ultimately a decision will uh, first and foremost be one of political alliances and, and votes. You, you just mentioned that we are not having the debate on the responsibilities of the Council, but one could uh, in fact argue that uh, these responsibilities are, are well outlined enough in the Charter. Uh, isn't it the case? Or? Interestingly, it's not, um, and uh, that's partly to the origins of the Charter. In 1945, Britain, um, uh, the United States, and the Soviet Union, having just been victors of World War II, um, were significantly more powerful than other states in the international system. They chose to bring in uh, France, which was still then under German occupation, and the nationalist Chinese. Um, in, in part because of the, 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 the potential for those two countries, and recognition that they would become major powers again in, 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 in the future. Um, but they brought them in without much controversy um, at the time. The, the, the vast number of smaller and medium states, and we're talking mainly when the UN was founded, uh, 51 original members, m largely from Latin America, Caribbean and, and Europe, um, there, w there wasn't so much controversy about the fact that those five were appointing themselves to be in the, in, in, the, uh, in, in the top club. So there's actually nothing in the Charter which says what the particular responsibilities of permanent membership are. There's nothing in the Charter which says why those five were picked. It's simply that they have a responsibility to uh, contribute forces to create a UN standing army. But, but one would think that, in fact, their responsibilities uh, are in line with the ones of the Council. So as long as the responsibilities of the Council are specific enough, the, the, it, it comes to, uh, I mean, it, the, the responsibilities of the uh, permanent members is, uh, are, are, are to make sure that these responsibilities, which are the ones of the council, are really being pursued and fulfilled. But it's not enough in your view. The, 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 the difficulty is the language of the, star, the charter is still quite general. The responsibilities, for example, are the general maintenance of international peace and security, the determination of if there is a threat to, threat to the peace or an act of aggression, and then to determine what the response of the Council should be. 
But there's nothing about who pays. There's nothing about who contributes those forces. There's nothing about whether maintenance of peace is more about mediation or upholding the rule of law, or it's actually having troops on the ground. So there's a lot of question marks about what, what the enforcement capability will be. Because the Security Council itself is a deliberative body. It doesn't in itself have any mechanism to enforce the peace. It relies on member states. Yeah, but one could also, I'm just being the, the, the advocate, but one could also argue that the ad hoc development of peacekeeping operations somehow has answered or is answering this, uh, this lack of, or, or is somehow filling the gap uh, when it comes to this lack of specificity uh, that you have been pointing regarding uh, the council. Absolutely. In the 1940s, there were attempts to agree a UN um, standing force, an army, navy, and aircraft. And they got uh, blocked very quickly in the emerging Cold War. Uh, the, the P-5 couldn't agree on how many units of Navy, Army, and Air Force they would contribute. Um, peacekeeping then evolved as a default mechanism. Yes. Um, uh, in the beginning, it was confined to um, uh, uh, intervening after the conflict had stopped to give the party space to have a political negotiation. Peacekeeping evolved in the 1990s to not require the consent of the parties con uh, concerned to be what was called more robust. So that it was still impartial, but it didn't necessarily require consent. Uh, and increasingly, it invoked Chapter 7 of the Charter, the, the part of the Charter that was going to govern the use of a UN standing, a standing army. So peacekeeping has been really valuable in decreasing the amount of interstate conflict, uh, uh, decreasing the amount of violence in the world. But it is only applicable to certain types of operation and largely uh, situations where violence has subsided or where it's at a low enough level to be addressed. Uh, the larger issues of interstate war require peace enforcement, and there it requires on coalitions of the willing of member states to be acting under Security Council authorization, but not necessarily under um, a blue helmet. It's actually a war fighting force rather than a peacekeeping force. So composition is one of these issues with, uh, which is part of this uh, never-ending uh, working group agenda. Uh, what would be the second issue? We could say size. Size, okay. Um, the council at the moment is 15. It was originally 11 when it started out. Uh, the council membership has grown. It was just over 100 when the council was enlarged uh, in 1965. And now it stands at 193. So simply on that basis, the expansion of the membership, but also on the basis that the uh, relative power of member states has shifted, particularly that the developing world has become M more significant in economic, in political, in security terms. Uh, so there's a recognition that the, uh, the Council's membership should reflect current realities. So size is another matter. What would be another issue which is, uh, you said, vo voting methods? Yeah, well, I'll just finish on size. So there are various proposals to expand the Council, perhaps to 21, perhaps to 25. That's the sort of range within which um, many observers feel the Council could retain its effectiveness, but also uh, have I increased representation. Uh, and do you feel that if uh, the size of the council was changing and if we were bringing more uh, developing countries to the table of the Security Council, so to speak, do you think that the, the kind of uh, 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 the, the policies uh, uh, of the council as conveyed by its decisions and, and calls for action, do you think that these policies would be different? I think it's likely. In part, and how so? Well, partly because uh, an increase in the size of the council would also likely mean an, an increase in developing countries on the council and an increase in uh, countries from Asia. And what we've seen is that countries from the group of 77 developing countries and Asian continent generally tend to um, be less uh, willing to support military interventions into conflicts which might be seen to be uh, intrastate. Um, happening within a country, Intra, interesting. interesting. So, so a a concern about the council intervening characterizes the developing country view on peace and security issues. Obviously, it, it varies between countries, so it's a generalization. But what we are likely to see in an expanded council, it harder to uh, for the council to authorize peace enforcement operations or robust peacekeeping in particular contexts. But does it mean that uh, we would uh, witness uh, greater reluctance for uh, uh, action in support of human rights? It may do also. It may do also. Um, if you have an increase in countries that are non-democracies, they have a particular sensitivity about human rights. Uh, 
because the, the record as the Human Rights Council and the, the Commission on Human Rights before has shown is that democracies tend to uh, respect both economic and social and civil and political rights more mm. than non-democracies. So it will really depend on who gets selected and who gets elected to those seats. So it's too early to say on, 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 on the human rights side. Uh, voting methods, you said that it's part of the agenda of the working group. Indeed, voting methods is sometimes seen as an alternative to expansion, but it's also uh, a, a, an additional and, and a much needed um, uh, development. Working methods tends to focus on transparency and accountability. The concept that while the Security Council is given a mandate by the Charter to take action that's binding on all member states in the international peace and security arena, it also has to listen to the voice of the membership as a whole. And that's either through pronouncements by the General Assembly, which have no binding legal um, effect on the Council, but they have an important moral weight, or, and increasingly, it's through consultations with regional groups, with other actors, through, through friends of the Secretary General, contact groups, peace, uh, um, contributors to peacekeeping operations. These are all valuable ways in which the Council members informally and formally interact with other member states in a way that makes their decisions more inclusive um, and that they, they listen more, which must be a, a good thing. The, and the Council has also engaged more over the last 15, 20 years with non-governmental organizations. But precisely on, on, on this matter, do you feel that uh, in the past 15 years things have improved? I mean, prior to the 1990s, I mean, it's my understanding that things were <coughs> taking place very much within, I mean, behind closed doors. It's less the case now. So do you feel that in terms of transparency, in terms of openness, when it comes to uh, decision-making processes in the context of the Council, do you think that things have improved? I think or is it, or am I delusional? I think they have improved. Uh, and I think that not, not principally because of, of formal or informal consultations with NGOs, but for, for two reasons. One, NGOs have professionalized. They, they generally have people who have something that they can really add to the work of the Council. And many NGOs that have a presence in, in countries that are suffering from conflict uh, bring valuable early warning and other, other advice that's mm -hmm. useful to Council members. The, um, so that's, uh, that, that, that's the principal reason. The second is, the world we live in is a more globalized world. The effect of 24-hour media um, and a much more internationalized um, advocacy presence among NGOs creates a, a, uh, an information source and a backdrop that uh, is ever-present now in the minds of council members. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a sharp contrast to the days when um, a long-distance telephone call was, was a big deal mm -hmm. and uh, ambassadors would have to wait for days to get instructions yeah, from the capitals. Yeah, you talked about smartphones this afternoon. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Uh, you're now with a, a, a smartphone which are proliferating across Africa and Asia. You can actually do a, a, a quick um, indicative poll of, of a million people fairly easily. Uh, Facebook uh, um, is ways of, of people organizing uh, revolutions in, in, in And in, no in dialing countries. is necessary. And no dialing is necessary. Mm. You just have to, you're often um, l logged on all the time. And mm. uh, w as you get more and more interconnectivity, as you get more and more people with, with um, always on internet access and capability, I think you're going to get uh, the, the ambassadors in, in New York and Geneva mm. and Nairobi, uh, Vienna, other UN, other UN centers increasingly uh, taking action under the spotlight of uh, an in international uh, moral um, um, uh, force of, yeah. of civil society. So composition, size, vot uh, the uh, voting methods, what else do we have on this agenda of uh, the working we, we, group? We have the categories of membership, categories. which is a really interesting one because we have the, the two categories we're familiar with, permanent members and non-permanent members. It's been suggested that we have some kind of third category or intermediate category of a longer duration seat, um, where a, a country might be elected. But which is not in effect so far. It's not in effect. Okay, but this that's is, part of the... This is one of the um, reform proposals. Yeah. Uh, so, so you have a new long category. Long-term duration. So it could be uh, a, a country like India or Brazil or, or, or Nigeria, South Africa, um, Germany, Japan, um, uh, might stand for election in the General Assembly against countries like Egypt, uh, Argentina, um, Kenya and others who may have a chance of getting it. And they would be elected to a seat for a 10 or 15 year period, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps immediately re-electable. 
And that would mean that they would get all the advantages of permanency, so getting to know the Secretariat, other member states, getting to know the procedures and how the Council operates. So they could have a lot more influence, but they would still be an accountability linked because they would be voted for by the General Assembly and they could be removed by the General Assembly. So it might be a nice halfway house that would increase legitimacy. Yeah, but once incumbent, it would be difficult to remove them. It depends on uh, what the vote is to, uh, to re-elect them. The, the, would, the, they have the, 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 would, they ha would they have veto power? I don't think they would. Um, and there's two reasons for that. While the, the veto of the, the current Permanent Five may be uh, seen as anachronistic, particularly in the case of Britain and France, which haven't used their veto since the late 1980s in any case, so they recognize that it's a bit anachronistic. But the veto is also a positive thing. It keeps powerful countries like China and the United States within a mar marriage of power and representation. It keeps them within a system of laws and norms within w operating within the, the Security Council rather than outside of it. So the question is, if, if it's not easy to um, uh, modify the existing veto, because um, the, 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 the countries that have the veto have a veto to prevent it being changed, so they're very clever in designing the charter that way. Yes. So, so the veto is very hard to get rid of. But do, you, do two, two wrongs make a right? Do you add to that, add to that uh, the number of countries that can block decisions on the Council, or do you in fact take a different approach? And the different approach that um, uh, former Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali suggested is that in fact by expanding the Council, by increasing the number of developing countries, and by raising the threshold required for passing a substantive resolution, you will increase, you have a collective veto for the South, because acting collectively those countries can um, uh, prevent a resolution that they uh, they don't like. So there would occurring. be no need for a, a real veto. No need for an individual veto yeah, yes. allocated to a country, but you would have a stronger, uh, in a way, southern veto um, that was created in a de facto way. Yeah. So I, I think generally uh, the aspirant permanent members, those that are seeking permanent membership, by now they realize they're not going to get a veto anytime soon. So they might as well uh, get a longer duration seat, prove themselves to their region, get all the benefits of permanency and revisit their quest for a permanent um, seat 15 years or 30 yeah. years down the line. So that's for categories. What else do we have on the agenda? I'm just going down the list. Sure. Well, we've, 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 we've dealt with everything except the relationship between the General Assembly and the Security okay, Council. Okay, so what about this? We touched on it briefly um, when it came to the issue of um, uh, accountability to the, to the General Assembly. What is the Security Council's mandate in the Charter? It is to have primary responsibility for the maintenance of peace and security. But it's not to have exclusive responsibility. It's accepted that the General Assembly has a subsidiary responsibility when the Security Council is not seized of a matter, that it has a responsibility to act as well. And uh, people or to call for the Council to act. Indeed. So if the, if the Council is deadlocked or if the Council is not, not seeming to, to act, both the General Assembly can make recommendations and that's its power, to make recommendations, not to act. And the Secretary General, he, he or she, under Article 99, can bring to the attention of the Council a, th a threat to peace and security. So the relationship between the Security Council and the General Assembly has always been a tricky one. The permanent members of the Security Council are, do not want any constraints on the, the remit of the of the Security Council, which is l legally laid down in the Charter. It's given a lot of power precisely because it's expected that its members will uh, contribute a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, the General Assembly is the ultimate source of legitimacy for the organization because it's a universal body. But it also, it has members like Palau with only a few thousand population, countries like China with over a billion. So it itself is not a alternative automatic font of legitimacy. It itself has legitimacy problems with the, the, the idea of one state, one vote. So it's not contrasting legitimacy with power. It's contrasting two bodies which, in different ways, manage um, that relationship between power and representation. So these are the issues which are on the agenda of the reform of the, of the Council. And, and you are telling us that it has been, uh, you know, uh, we have been at work on this for 17 years. So. Um, 
on all these issues, are we doing, I mean, what's the extent of the progress which has been made? I mean, are we close to uh, witnessing a true reform of the council or is it still a, a dream? Well, the fact that the negotiations have been continuing for 17 years is not a mark of, of the lack failure. Lack of progress. Of lack of progress or, or necessarily a failure. Because this is an issue of enormously high stakes to individual countries. It's a matter uh, of enormous high stakes for the world because the Security Council is a precious thing. Um, it's a remarkable achievement of humanity to delegate to a few countries um, the maintenance of peace and security. And the fact that 90% of Security Council resolutions are passed by consensus is an indicator that there's a high degree of um, a, a agreement, of working together among those members. It take, they take their responsibilities um, Serious. seriously. So the fact that we haven't seen much progress is in part because in a negotiating process as important as this, in one which in many ways is a zero-sum game, by which I mean that if one council, if one me member becomes a, a, a permanent mem member of the Security Council, another one can't be. If you expand to 21 um, members on the Council, there's still a lot of members that can't get on, for yes. example. So that, that, that's the reason. But in part because of the longevity of the negotiations, we're beginning to see a bit of fatigue. We're beginning to see the, the ideal or maximalist position of permanent members to be, aspirant permanent members, and we're seeing the maximalist position of the what are called the Uniting for Consensus group, those that want non-permanent expansion only, that they both recognize they're not going to get everything that they want. And that perhaps the status quo um, is, is not the best default position. So what you need to get reform is for the main groups to let go of their ideal situations. And you need the main groups to accept that a particular model of reform is better than the status quo. And nothing. And it's still very hard to identify a particular formula that meets the very tough charter requirement of an initial vote of two-thirds of the members of the UN, ratification by two-thirds of the parliaments and governments of the UN members, including ratification by the five permanent members. That's quite a hurdle to get through because you just need a third of member states who are not happy, who prefer the status quo, and it's dead in the water. And, and what are the chances for, for, for change to take place uh, in the near future? If I had to put a percentage on it of change within a three or four year period, I would say that the likelihood be, would be 30 to 40 percent likely that change will happen. So in in other words, it is unlikely that change will happen, but it's more likely that change will happen than it has, has been for a very long time. Okay. Um, this afternoon, we, 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 we had this conversation on the connection between, or the lack of connection between principles and power. Clearly, uh, all the panelists uh, were somehow recognizing that uh, uh, there are virtues to uh, uh, having uh, great powers in the Security Council. And that, uh, but that at the same time, uh, the, the presence of great powers in the Security Council brings about issues of consistency and lack perhaps of, a, of an uh, alignment between power and, and, and legitimacy, power and principles. How do you feel about this? Uh, well, we live in a very messy world and we live in a very unequal world. And many uh, advocates of uh, an improved United Nations um, wish the world was, was different, um, uh, uh, as do I. But it's not. So we, we have to, to start with the world where it is. If we start with the world where it is, then we're left with uh, many advantages to the, uh, uh, the Security Council's role. One advantage that a lot of smaller and medium-sized countries uh, really treasure is the fact that the Security Council authorizes and deauthorizes the use of force in international affairs. So it can act potentially as a constraining force on large powers using force. And even if they go and ignore the Council, there is a cost cost in terms of burden sharing, a cost in terms of perceived legitimacy. So that's one, one advantage of the Council operating in an unequal world. The other thing is, is it's able to mobilize resources. So the world is unequal because different countries have different abilities to contribute to peace and security. Through UN processes, through a, a scale of peacekeeping dues, contributions, you have 
um, uh, countries with a greater capability actually giving more, doing more. Um, the, so the Security Council helps mobilize both in peacekeeping, in, in political missions, in mediation, but also in coalitions of the willing acting under Security Council authorization to take enforcement action war fighting in pursuit of the, uh, uh, the UN's objectives. So by, by really an interesting happen chance evolution from starting out with a United Nations of 51 countries, largely from Latin America and Europe, we now have a remarkable thing. We have 193 countries, an almost universal membership, um, scanning all the regions of the world with a Security Council, with a mandate on behalf of humanity, on behalf of um, the, the, the under, under represented peoples of the world as well, um, to maintain international peace and security. But, but it's, and so, well, you, 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 as you just mentioned, the, the primary, if not sole, mandate of the Council is to maintain international peace and security. But does it make sense to try to do so while somehow pursuing this uh, in, in a way which is totally disconnected from uh, issues having to do with development. For instance, the, at the European Union level, uh, somehow you know, the European Union developed out of trying to avoid uh, that uh, war would take place again in the European context. And yet we don't have really uh, an entity which is, devo which is devoted to uh, security issues simply because the European Union project has been about development and, and public policy at the regional level. So can we truly achieve security, maintain peace and security at the global level uh, through an institution which is solely uh, devoted to, 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 to peace and security and in, in totally uh, disconnected ways compared to development commitments and so on and so on? You, you raise a very, very important point, which is that the, um, the world is um, one continuous um, world. Yes. It isn't divided into human rights, into development, into, in, into security. Uh, but former Secretary General Kofi Annan made, uh, I think, some important um, uh, points about, about So, about I mean, this. in a sense, my, my sub-question is, can we truly achieve security by focusing, through an institution, by focusing almost exclusively on security? My, my sense is that it is not possible, but what do you think about this? Well, in order to tackle an issue, you have to. You need a division of labor. You need, to, uh, you need a division of labor, but that division of labor needs to be done in a complementary way, and that's one of the uh, perhaps the beauties of the. Uh, you gave the example of the U European Union system, of the, their principle of s subsidiarity, that you devolve decisions to the to the lowest level possible, the the level closest to the grassroots, and that's the way that the the security system can work best. It actually. Uh, and the Charter says this. First of all, you have uh, Chapter 6, Article 33. You have a conflict, you attempt to resolve it by, by mediation, by negotiation, by judicial settlement, by peaceful settlement. If that fails, you go to Chapter 8 of the Charter and regional organizations. If that fails, you go to the Security Council. If necessary, sanctions, peace enforcement, and so on. So there is a, a, um, a, a scale where you're, you're going up the, up the channel to the global body at the top. There's a separate set of issues about the division between uh, development and peace. You can only have sustainable peace if you have development. But equally, you can only have development if you have st security and stabilization. Yeah. So there was debates at both ends of the, of the spectrum. In terms of humanitarian aid delivery, there's an increased recognition that it's worth focusing on fragile and failing states, because otherwise you will then um, uh, have to spend more money at a later time, and that, that development aid is, is great for security. But, 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 but equally, um, you, will not, so the, um, you, you, will, you will not be able to, to, to get development unless but, you have but security. But in, in a way, you see, when you look at uh, what has been the, uh, the regions and the countries on which the, the Council has focused for 50 years, I mean, we tend to continue to focus, I mean, the Council tends to continue to focus on regions which are not really developed. I mean, you know, uh, in the 50s, Africa was very much on the agenda of the Council, the Middle East too, and so on and so on. So somehow these regions which are not developed uh, continue to be a security problem. So is it really the solution to address uh, security issues essentially through military means or within the context of military thinking and uh, uh, military mechanisms? So should we think about perhaps dovetailing better than it has been the case so far, uh, development concerns with security concerns? Well, the, coming out of various uh, um, international commissions, including the, the UN's high-level panel, 
um, set up at, um, by, by, by Kofi Annan, um, uh, uh, we, we've had emerged a peace building commission, which attempts to be a, an institution that bridged uh, the gap between security and development. But it's not working very well. It, it isn't working well. Or uh, not working at all. I know. I think that's unfair to it. I think that, that in, in the countries that it's focused on, um, there has been some, some progress. It's certainly focused international attention on those issues. But, but a sign that it's not working is the fact that the Security Council has begun its own debate about um, uh, configured around stabilization, which in many ways mirrors a lot of the objectives of the Peace Building Commission, but doesn't involve it. So there's very little... Uh, other than formal institutional links between those bodies. Very little consultation by the Security Council um, of, of members of the Peace Building Commission. Um, I, I, I think it, it's, it's always going to be a pressure that the Security Council is dominated by the press. If it bleeds, it leads. There will be pressure on politicians in capitals. They put pressure on ambassadors to address behavioral conflict, to, be, to address fighting on the streets. So the, there has to be a mechanism to do that, and I think that the, the various tools that the Security Council has at its disposal, and it's getting better and better and having more and more effective tools, um, are being honed to address that. But other parts of the UN system, and indeed organizations outside of the United Nations, have an important role in, in preventing conflict from starting in the first place. And you're absolutely right. That fundamentally is about people having uh, enough, enough food, um, a, a bed for the night and, and a sense of security. Um, a, a, a famous um, British parliamentarian from the 19th century, William Cobbett, uh, famously, um, uh, uh, famously said, I defy you to agitate a man with a full stomach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's as true today as it was before, that, that actually if you meet basic needs, then you can uh, remove a lot of the causes of the conflict. Having said that, there are elements of conflict which are due to do with relative rather than absolute deprivation. Yeah. So th there is a part, of, uh, a part of our development approach has to be focused on uh, dealing with inequality as well as taking people out of absolute poverty. E so it's the perceptions of, of relative mm -hmm. deprivation as well as uh, having a full stomach uh, that are the ultimate seeds yeah. of peace. Uh, uh, but the fact that the uh, council is viewed as... as, uh, as as, as such a strategic uh, organization, uh, and the fact that it's really about uh, uh, approaching matters and addressing matters of one piece in a very traditional fashion in the end. I mean, does it, I mean, I, I would be tempted to think that perhaps it tells us that we are not really uh, conceiving of matters of one piece the right way. Well, the Security Council uh, it was done two things. One, it has evolved despite uh, not changing its membership much. It's, it's evolved in a remarkable way. The council was set up to, to deal with conflicts between states. Nearly all its attention, the 15 peacekeeping operations at the moment, all but one are, are focused on conflicts within states. states yes. Mo moreover, it, it started to get into issues of protections of civilians. There's been the responsibility to protect issue. There's been a uh, relationship to the, to the International Criminal Court and International Criminal Jurisdiction and Justice and the ad hoc uh, and, and hybrid tribunals. So we've seen a remarkable evolution in the, in the nature of the work that the Council does. It is still largely traditional peace and security. Now, when, it, when it's had thematic debates on issues like women, peace and security, on climate change and other issues, some countries have said it's going beyond its traditional remit, which is to focus on conflict-specific mm -hmm. situations into thematic issues. Um, uh, and it's a dilemma for its, for its legitimacy. I think generally, if I take those two examples, women, peace and security is seen as highly legitimate because it's, it's increasingly seen that if you do not involve women in peacemaking, uh, actually in, in, in mediation of conflicts, in, in the creation of, of constitutions and, and agreements on, on how a country will, will evolve out of conflict, you will not get sustainable peace. On the issue of climate change, it's much harder to to get agreement among member states that the Security Council is the right uh, forum for discussion yeah. of climate change. Because uh, what, what a number of member states say is, yes, it's a threat to humanity, but what can the Security Council do about it? And there is a legitimacy danger that if you have debate and then you have no ability to operationalize that debate, mm -hmm. to mobilize resources towards an outcome, 
then that, over time, delegitimizes an institution. When it comes to, you, to, to women, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, clearly, uh, and it has been the case in the, 15, the past 15 years in the Balkans and so on, women have been victims of war, and, uh, and, and on the other hand, they are very much uh, uh, engineers of peace. And unless you, 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 you really uh, bring them to the table, you're not going to have sustainable peace. So you are telling us that the, uh, the, um, the, the, the work of the council has evolved a lot in the past 15 years, and you're absolutely right. So uh, if you had a crystal ball, what would be the likely evolution of the work of this council uh, between now, 2011, and uh, uh, 2030? What would, what would be the, 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 the big evolutions that you, would force, that you could foresee? Well, I find it hard enough to understand yes. the past, yes, uh, yes. Uh, even harder to predict the, the future. So, so rather, than, rather than try to predict what will happen, there are a number of phenomena now that could give indications of what, what will face the council moving forward. One is that there's quite a lot of violence that occurs in the world that's not on the Security Council's agenda at all. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of, of, of urban violence, um, which may be fueled by organized crime or by by poverty related or other corruption or other things but but it, it, it's a phenomenon that a lot of people die from those causes rather than from the the old traditional uh, uh, wars so so will the security council evolve to to look at, at conflicts and the seeds of conflicts in in uh, within countries in those sort of situations but this would this would re this would require for these problems to be more than uh, police matters indeed and yes. already already the united nations increasingly uses um, police in its peacekeeping operations and peace forces in terms of its election monitoring, in its nation building. So, so there's already a recognition that police provide a very valuable role in, in creating and sustaining the rule of law in countries and mm -hmm. that the rule of law is, is vital. Now, other areas are, I mean, there's continuing threats from new transnational actors like Al-Qaeda. Now, Al-Qaeda is, is, is not unique, but... Um, but it is uh, remarkable in that it does not accept the legitimacy of the interstate order or the United Nations. So um, um, awfully, um, with tragic consequences, it has targeted UN civilian workers for humanitarian agencies in many countries in the world. They are seen by Al-Qaeda as legi legitimate targets, so, which is an absolutely abhorrent uh, philosophy and ab abhorrent approach. Um, so the UN increasingly has to deal with transnational actors where you can't easily hold a particular state to account other than um, providing safe refuge where, in the cases where it does. There's also issues... Had, uh, just uh, a parenthesis, mm. had uh, Osama bin Laden uh, been captured, uh, what would have been the, the jurisdiction precisely in a position to somehow put him on trial? Well, the, the International <coughs> Criminal Court wouldn't have been the right place. Well, the, exactly the same um, issues arise as those um, individuals who were taken to Guantanamo Bay by, yes. by the U.S. So uh, I mean, lawyers have rehearsed the arguments about non-combatants and, and, and the different jurisdictions of, of courts. Um, there's certainly a number of Security Council resolutions which, which uh, allow member states who have been affected by um, uh, uh, terrorist acts to hold accountable and to, 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 to put on trial um, uh, uh, individuals that have committed acts against their people. So that's well covered by existing Security Council resolutions. Uh, you could also create other kind of um, um, mechanisms on an ad hoc basis, but uh, it's, a, it's a moot point anyway in his case. I was going to mention uh, another category uh, of threats, uh, which is cyber threats. Um, uh, increasingly, we're hearing about cyber crime. We're hearing about offensive and defensive cyber capability. We've already seen uh, examples of, of, of countries come under cyber attack by another country. Um, so that would be very interesting to see how the international community and the Security Council develop mechanisms to deal with um, attacks which can have devastating consequences on the infrastructure of a com country and can result in many deaths mm. and suffering of people, but don't involve uh, the sort of weaponry that we're used to. And what is, what is permissible in terms of uh, response, retaliation, proportionality, all the issues around um, uh, the, the legality of, of war, um, um, uh, also some of those or most of those may apply to the cyber realm, or they may not. Um, so the world is 
uh, our globalizing world with uh, technological discoveries is changing in fascinating ways, and our response also must change. On the really positive side, the record of the Security Council in decreasing the amount of violent conflict has been an excellent one. And increasingly, academic studies are demonstrating that the combination of different tools at the disposal of the Council, with its eclectic membership marrying power and representation, has actually been a great service to humanity. And if we do have a reform of the Council, one of the things which is really precious and needs to be, uh, to, to be kept at the forefront is that the Council needs to be not just more representative of power, but it also needs to retain its effectiveness, its creativity, and its ability to maintain peace and security in the future. Perhaps a, a final question to end our conversation. You are from the UK, I'm from France. Uh, in the European context, we have all these debates about whether or not the European Union should uh, represent European countries all together on the Council. As a way to conclude our conversation, what do you think about this issue? Should uh, European powers uh, be represented all together by one seat, the one of the European Union? I should add, I'm also a dual national of Australia yes. as well as the UK. Mm -hmm. I'm, proud of, I'm, I'm proud of my, uh, my Australian roots as well. Um, uh, the, the, the permanent members were, um, uh, or particularly the European permanent members, were, were very careful when the Maastricht Treaty was drawn up, creating the framework for European Union foreign policy, that uh, the membership of the Security Council by Britain and France um, would not be subject to uh, integration and a European seat. So as early as, uh, as the early 1990s, they were very conscious that that was, that was uh, their concern in greater European integration. Now, over time, it's possible that the Security Council will rely more on regional representation. But there are a number of problems with was simply substituting Britain and France with a European seat. One is uh, that it can be hard for the European Union to make decisions. Uh, there yeah, are they disagreed on Libya. France. They disagreed on Libya, but also in a timely fashion in mobilizing. And this would be the same if, if the African Union had a seat on the Security Council or the Arab League had a seat on the Security Council. Regional organizations are not so necessarily pro, yeah. mm -hmm. are not necessarily the, the, um, able to take decisions at the speed that the Security Council needs. That, that, that having been said, uh, Britain and France do consult quite widely with their European Union partners and allies before they, 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 they take positions. So the issue is not should the EU replace Britain and France. The issue is, um, is Britain and France doing enough to merit its permanent seats? Mm -hmm. And, and there you get back to the issue of what are the responsibilities yeah. of the permanent members, what are the responsibilities of new possible permanent members, and so on. So that's a debate that we should be talking about. Um, what do we expect from the permanent members and the non-permanent members and the rest of the membership? And also, what is the overall balance in the Council? There's no point in decreasing the European Union representation by uh, replacing Britain and France by, 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 by one seat if it's felt that Europe is then underrepresented on the Council. So any decision about changing representation needs to be seen in the whole. And that is a marriage, again, of power and representation. You need those countries that have the ability to um, make a difference in, in, in delivering um, uh, troops on the ground, uh, who can afford to finance operations, having the appropriate level of input. That may mean seats on the Council, it may mean that they're being consulted, mm -hmm. This is a, a, a you know a, a much much more wider debate. The, the 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 crucial the crucial issue is that you preserve that that match of having both representation and power, um, and that the Security Council is able to to continue its work. So, and the need to to go back to this issue, which you say this debate, which we you say we're not having on what is the responsibilities of uh, of permanent members in the context of the Council, rather than focusing on who, focusing on what, and you seem to think that this is absolutely crucial. I do, and, and in fact, if you look at Britain and France, um, and I don't think of this as a, a, a partial view, if you look at their record in contributing, both countries have contributed um, uh, uh, an enormous amount over the 65 years of the United Nations, both financially, in terms of uh, contributions to 
peacekeeping operations to peace enforcement operations as mediators, using their, their former colonial contacts to, to, uh, to try and um, uh, uh, bring about negotiated settlements to, 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 to conflicts. Um, as well as contributing a lot on the human rights side and, and towards the Millennium Development Goals, being two of the largest contributors of aid. So I think on a lot of criteria, those countries do, do quite well. Uh, it is a bit anachronistic. Why should they have a, a veto these days? And, and, and also they contributed because they were in a position to contribute, but uh, you know, uh, who knows, perhaps other countries which could have been in a position to contribute could have contributed also as well as these countries. Uh, th that, that, that's very true. So as we're looking forward, we need to be able to, within, uh, within the difficulties of reforming the Charter, which is so hard to do, which means that you won't be easily be able to simply re replace countries or move them around, you need to find ways to, to engage and, and show respect to, to, to countries for their contribution. And I, I do want to emphasize that, that, that contribution can be in many forms. It's countries like Norway that have um, played such a valuable role with the Os Oslo process in mediating between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, you've got a number of smaller African countries that have played very important peacemaking roles. You've got countries in Latin America that, that have a, a remarkable record for respect for the rule of law and for non-military solutions. I think we need to capture um, all those valuable contributions to peace and security and, and have respect for them. Um, because it's not just about, about um, who can afford to contribute. It's about actually we live in a world where we now have respect for the worth of every human being and we should have respect for every country. And therefore, we should be looking to actually increase the number of contributions from the membership as a whole, rather than just focusing on a narrow few. But if, if a few have privileged positions, then they will be expected to deliver a lot.